I went through the biggest rainstorm of the year. Or I think it was like in two years. I ended yeah. up kind of, yeah, I was, in, I was going through wine country. I just come down off some mountains and I'm walking through a valley and all of a sudden just like a, like a biblical tempest, man, just kicks up. So that was, that was the first night I pulled out the plastic sheet and I jumped in under some eucalyptus tree. I'm kind of just weathering it. You can hear the thunder going in the background. Thunder, lightning, and I'm just under mm. these eucalyptus trees, but I'm so tired and I'm so cozy underneath this plastic that I, I slept like for eight to, to 12 hours. Woke up, wow. pristine, pristine air, completely renewed. And then I... Pocket Party Podcast. It's my favorite podcast. We're back. Hey, everybody. It's your host, Darren Carter, the party starter, with a very, very special guest. This man, yes, yes, he walked so far. I love hearing about this kind of stuff. And ladies and gentlemen, you know him from, he was an officer in the Irish Army. He's a stand-up comedian. I've worked with him many times. He's the creator of Rough Set, an ambassador to homeless health care Los Angeles. Please welcome Mr. Frank Ronan. Hey, Darren, always a pleasure, what a gift to be with you, how are you? I'm great, thank you, man, happy new year, happy 2021. Yeah, dude, we're off and running already, it's uh, carnage, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> dude, you know what's funny is, uh, um, when, number one, I love the story, you walked from San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge to Los Angeles, and I was following it in real time on Instagram because at the, at the time you were posting it on your Insta stories and I loved it. You know, like a lot of people, they love these YouTube channels where people go camping in the woods or camping, you know, in Alaska or wherever they can. And so to me, it was like, it was, it was incredible to watch it. And I want to thank you for being on the show today. Thank you, Frank. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Back about, uh, it's actually about nearly two years now. I've done one uh, in America, one big long walk in America and one in Ireland. And uh, yeah, it was 400 and something miles. I think it was 497 all in. Uh, but it was a little longer because I kept getting lost. And it was a charity walk, basically, for Homeless Healthcare Los Angeles. And uh, the idea was walk from San Francisco all the way to L.A. without ever sleeping indoors and using kind of my, uh, my background in m the military. Uh, to survive and act as a kind of conduit for people to understand the plight of the homeless. And I'd kind of documented it along the way. It was good fun. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it was a great idea, like to, to, to do the walk and then do comedy sets as you were coming down the coast of California, you know, a rough set, hence the name. And uh, <clears throat> what, um, how, how many, how long did it take you to prepare for something like that? Oh, I'd say I was training on and off. Uh, but with more regularity just before setting off for about six months to a year. And uh, by the last few weeks, I was doing about 20 miles a day walking. Wow. Uh, and, and, you know, that's just to kind of condition yourself so you don't get injured as soon as you start. But, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's only walking, you know. And as long as you stay on your feet and uh, you put the miles in beforehand – it's it's not that hard the hard stuff is the survival and the uh you know not getting hypothermic and uh you know not getting killed and left or eaten at the side of the road yeah <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's interesting because uh one of the, my favorite books to listen to is called a walk in the woods by bill bryson and he talks about walking on the appalachian trail and that's out in the woods and and some people do what's called a through walk where they do it all in one i mean they go from I'm not, not exactly sure how far it is. I know it's from like, I want to say Georgia all the way up to the Canadian border and other people do it in pieces. They're like, okay, we're going to do a hundred miles at a time. And then next summer we'll do the next hundred and that kind of thing. But I, mm -hmm. I mean, what you did was uh, pretty remarkable as well. You know, it's uh, it, some of it was urban where you're actually walking, starting out on the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And then there was parts where you were yeah. in the middle of nowhere and, and, uh, um, let me ask yeah, you, did you, did you go ahead? Yeah, just to give you kind of an overview so that your listeners have a, a rough idea. So basically, I started in San Francisco and I ended up in downtown LA. And uh, I started on the north 
east side of the Golden Gate Bridge to absolutely no fanfare. And then by the time I got to L.A., I had hit up, hit up about six clubs along the way and got to perform with, uh, you know, some really great comedians along the way, like uh, Craig Shoemaker, um, Preacher Lawson. And then I closed out the final shows at the Dynasty Typewriter, which is like one of the cool clubs in L.A. And uh, on that show was uh, Jeff Garland. You know, he, he brought me on stage. Oh, from yeah. Printer. But that was pretty cool for me. Like I had never had that experience or anything like that. And then just the magic of kind of walking from uh, club to club, uh, which was <laughs> you know, maybe 10 days between each set. So it wasn't, uh, it, it was pretty fun, you know, it's a, a lot of time to think about material and um, it's a very easy way for a comedian to get stage time. It's a good story. It allowed me to get on stage a bit. Did, did you have, um, did you have like a, like a big suitcase that you rolled around or did you have like a giant nope. backpack or what did you have? Oh, I had a very small backpack and uh, I had one sleeping bag and I had a yoga mat and no tent. And I had one piece of plastic sheeting just in case. And um, the goal was to be kind of as light as possible and then just um, not have any weight to carry to keep it light and, and keep myself moving. <clears throat> But also to kind of mimic a lack of scarce or, you know, to mimic the scarce resources you might have if you were living out uh, yeah. and really helped. You know, I started off feeling pretty tough, feeling pretty confident, thinking I was going to it was going to be pretty easy, you know, with the right mindset. And then by the end of day one, I had had a, a stick in my eye, nearly lost my eye. And that was only in the first 24 hours. I was, uh, you know, I had a, I was doing a bit to camera. I was uh, documenting the, the thing. A friend of mine, John Ray, came along kind of in a follow car for the first few days and I was doing a piece to camera and I turned my face just a little too quick and a stick went in and I lost mm. about 30 percent of my cornea which is quite a big deal anymore and you're kind of you're goosed you know the eye is gone so um as soon as people saw that I didn't give up after that um it, people got very excited and then all of a sudden it was you know five hundred dollars a day rolling in for homeless healthcare Los Angeles which made me feel great and then once there's money coming in every day and uh, you get into the, the into the flow of things, it's hard to stop because now you're this vessel, you're this <laughs> conjure for other people's good nature. And uh, it was a real nice feeling to be in the middle of, it was the closest I've ever got to kind of being in a state of flow, of positive flow and everything's going through me. It wasn't really... Genuinely, you know the way people say this stuff and it sounds a bit contrived, but it really wasn't, at that point, it wasn't about me. It was like, oh my God, if I keep walking, the money's going to keep coming. And uh, <laughs> by the time we got to LA, Jeff Garland's bringing me on stage. There's like a hundred people in the audience. And uh, I had just done a TV interview that morning and it's kind of blown up. It's in the in the the Irish Times, the London Times, uh, Insider Edition did a piece and uh, there's twenty thousand dollars in the bank. So all that with just a, yeah. a phone and a tiny little bag of tricks. Yeah. What a story of inspiration! I remember at one point I think you, you they let you take over like the Irish Twitter or something like that, something from Ireland. Like remember that? Yeah. Yes. So the first day, just after I lost my, just after I got that uh, stick in the cornea, um the Irish consulate started following me, which is something they do. It's kind of like they keep an eye on their people. You know, Ireland is small enough that they can keep an eye on you. And I have a, 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 a small profile, but a large enough profile in Ireland for them to be aware of my existence. And I was doing some press for the thing over there. And so they, they started to follow me as soon as I uh, got in trouble with my eye. I guess they were making sure that I survived and keep an eye on me. Yeah. Uh, but the, the Irish concert followed me and then I got the Irish Twitter handle. So I was tweeting as the nation of Ireland. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> which, That's really awesome. Surreal. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Like imagine, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's magic. <laughs> and they gave me again the next year. I did one, I crossed Ireland from west to east and they gave me the Twitter handle again. And at the end of that one, I was on stage with Glenn Hansard and uh, Bono couldn't make it, but it was like, it was pretty amazing, you know? It's like, it just goes to show if, if you uh, if you get out of your own way, I think and, uh, you kind of follow your instinct, your intuition. And uh, even the simplest thing like going for a walk and documenting it, 
if the idea is good and you're helping others, others will come and help you. And that's, I know that's, it's, it's very cliche, but the, uh, uh, it really taught me something that I think I knew more instinctually as a child is that if you help others, other people will help you. And, um, yeah, that was like, oh my gosh, this is it. What's up, guys? How you like the show so far? Pretty good, right? Kind of weird that I'm out here in the country with the chair next to me. But anyways, if you like the show and you want to help out, go to Cameo. I do birthday shout-outs, anniversary shout-outs. Or if you just want to do a donation, go to DarrenCarter.com, PayPal, or Venmo, at Darren Carter Comic. Now let's get back to the show. Uh, really open. It reminded me of you know what my parents taught me when I was young, which is if, if you if you go out of your way and focus on others, uh, you'll never have to worry about yourself. And and uh, once I was going, dude, and there's money coming in, the charity's winning, I'm winning. I feel like I've got purpose in life, and then I'm getting to do my comedy and meeting people. It's beautiful. You, you said you had a follow car. Um, they were with you for the first three days, perhaps. Uh, three or four days. So my friend John. Um, I uh, bankrolled him up uh, with a very small amount of cash. He was very kind. Uh, he runs a magazine down in Mexico. So I flew him up and he slept in the back of this car, actually. Honda Fit for like, uh, I think the first, I'm not sure, five to five to ten days. He was very good. So he would sleep in the back of the car and then meet me in the morning. Now he's more of an indoor cat than I am. He'll admit that himself. So it was kind of shocking to his system. I was living outside. He had the car, but I think I was more comfortable because I'm, uh, I guess the military training and also just lying down flat on the ground, although it's cold. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm sleeping on golf courses. I'm sleeping in kind of hidden away uh, building sites and stuff like that. And he's kind of like stuck in a car in, in, in some sort of house. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. But uh, yeah, he documented. And then when I was coming into L.A. Uh, for the last three days, um, there was a little more media attention. So I was doing about two to three interviews a day, which was a surreal uh, amount of attention in my world. So I was doing two to three radio interviews a day, maybe two in Ireland and one in America. And then I had the, the morning TV news interview with spectrum which goes out all across mm. i believe california and, so, uh, yeah, let me ask was, you so you, so you had sort of a follow car like a little bit of a safety net um for about you know a few a few days like five to ten days and then how many days were you just out there by yourself just like no oh it was 40 it was actually 41 but uh wow. it would have been except i didn't want there to be too uh too biblical so I, I slowed it down my dad said you better slow down or people will start saying weird stuff <laughs> yeah exactly and, yeah it yeah. took me 420 days man 420 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well you know it was uh so the first week to be honest and he'd tell you himself um uh he was looking after me but uh, i was also kind of looking after him i would see him for about an hour every day and uh it would usually be at a place because we were kind of trying to document it and make it a, a documentary of the thing. Yeah. He would see me for about an hour a day. So maybe I would film in the morning on my cell phone, upload the morning video. Then I'd meet, that would be footage from that part of the time during the day. I do a few tweets, do a few bit of press. Then we'd have a waypoint along the way. It's kind of like a military operation. I right? say, John, I'll meet you here this roughly this time. I'll call you when I'm coming in. He'd be there. Or he'd drive ahead and capture me walking. and uh, Or we might do like a small interview at a, at a location. Then I'd upload another video onto the next spot. See him there. Blah, blah, blah. Shoot a piece of the camera. And then uh, I'd head to bed. And then he'd drive on ahead to the morning, to the first morning RV and uh, sleep in the car. Do you think you liked it more with, with, with a follow car and a little bit of a safety net? Or did you prefer it when being total alone? Uh, you know, it's definitely easier alone because um, having having John there was an absolute blessing, and he uh, he was very very helpful. But at, it it, it kind of takes away from the the depth of the experience having anybody along because uh, you know you can nearly do it all from your cell phone. 
Um, the thing about John, though, he was he's, he's so talented. He, he was able to make incredible promotional material. The fact that he has a as a magazine for a number of years, maybe ten years, you know, mm-hmm. that's a lot of access to a level of intelligence. The, that I the only have. <clears throat> the only thing I can compare it to is when I'm riding my bicycle. When I'm by myself, it's more freedom. I can just go when I want. I can go this left. I can go right. I don't have to answer to anybody. I can go fast as I want. I can go slow. I can stop. But then when I'm riding with my 13 year old son, I have to kind of keep looking back to make sure he's not too far back, make sure he, you know, you know what I mean? I got to focus more like, don't go left, go straight. You know, I got to, I'm not as free to just be my own man, you know? And I was wondering if maybe it was well, some of that. Uh, yeah. Well, that, that's, there's definitely, you know, uh, and I, yeah, a blessing to have him. I have to like realistically yeah. and have a blessing. But when I started doing, <laughs> when I got into the middle of it and I had kind of 20 days to myself and um, it became more of a kind of a spiritual journey. Now you're doing two, three days without speaking to another human. You're in the mountains. All of a sudden you can hear your thoughts and, you know, you start coming in contact with that, uh, that experience that I think a lot of people maybe, uh, as, as you stop worrying about the future, stop thinking about the past and become present, there is something appears there. Uh, some people I think call it God. Some people call it source energy. Some people uh, call it a higher power or, or intuition mm. or inspiration, but something happens when you're alone for long periods of time. And uh, I had a little friend with me mentally, and I think that that might be what people call God. And it was my first experience of it. That happened mm. about day 20. I'm up on a, I'm up on some railroad tracks and uh, all of a sudden, um, you know, I got into this rhythm. I was trying to hit every sleeper with my feet. And uh, then all of a sudden, I was in the vast expanse of absolutely no thought and uh, like an almost meditative state. Just What's a sleeper? Rest- you said you, you were trying to hit every sleeper with your feet. What's that? Oh, a sleeper is like the little wooden bit between. If you're walking <laughs> on tracks, it's the wooden thing, you know. It's- Dude, that's hilarious. You're picking up the hobo talk. I like it. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. I did. I slept in a railroad carriage I, as well. Yeah, I, I had some great places to sleep, man, as well as in people's back gardens and stuff like that. Uh, building sites were good. I love golf courses, but mm-hmm. uh, I slept let's, on the golf course by Google. And, I wanna, uh, uh, oh, 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 let's get you, you slept in the golf course by Google. Yeah. Yeah, That's I slept cool. there. It was pretty cool. I woke up and uh, there was just people teeing off. Just I'm under a tree and they're teeing <laughs> off. So pretty, very calm. You know, yeah. um, but the only thing is when you're out, you have to worry a little bit about wildlife, like, you know, the skunks and there's, uh, I want to ask you about that. Uh, uh, I want to ask you about that first night. Cause I remember something that you told me, uh, it was near the 280 freeway. And I remember it was after you, so Golden Gate Bridge, San Francisco, you're walking through San Francisco, which is already a lot of hills and it's big city. And, yeah. and then you're, and I remember you were filming it and I saw like broken glass from car windows. And I was like, Oh my gosh, it looked like you were walking through Beirut or something. And then I believe oh, yeah. you went, I think you went to the punchline, right? 444 battery street, the punchline comedy club. That was yes. one of the first big clubs I ever played. So I, I remember the address and the, and the name of it but uh, and i can totally picture where you're at um and then you walked south and i can picture this just from my earlier days living in the bay area and when you went south of san francisco i think you said the first night you started uh you slept near a freeway overpass and i think you said yeah, the I, thing that yeah yeah i was sleeping just in in between uh, the i-280 i think it was I'm not, not sure if the number is right, but basically there's a highway there. I'm 24 miles in and I, I know that if I sleep here, there's a good chance with the gym across the way that I can sneak in there in the morning. Like, hey, can I use your restroom? And then just belt into the shower, you know, and just be fresh again. Oh, I thought you were going to say get a quick workout in. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> Uh, but can, I, yeah. can I use your gym? Can I use the bathroom? And then you start pumping iron. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I was so tired that night. <laughs> I actually called somebody and uh, I said, hey, I said, oh, I'm near the beach. But it was actually the cars driving by. But I was delirious. It was on another planet. It was the, the cars driving by and each one sounded like a wave crashing. Uh, I woke up in the morning then to terrible traffic, a, a yeah. terrible head. And within five minutes, I had a twig in my eye and I was... Uh, under a lot of pressure 
<laughs> I remember that because you, you know, you, you, there's something people might not think of because when they go to sleep, it's kind of like, oh, there's the gym. Okay, it's it's, it's kind of quiet, and then you're waking up to just like traffic jams and horns and like the the loud noises and you know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah, and then there's also just when you're sleeping out, it gives you good insight into kind of uh, maybe what people go through at least a little taste of what it is but yeah when you know, there's a lot of um there's a lack of control you don't have a lot of security so there's a part of your brain that doesn't sleep your survival instinct is on overdrive so um your your brain is kind of keeping an eye out for things that might attack you in the middle of the night whether it's nature or another human so tell us um, about that. There was a thing I, I I remember you you said a hot tip. If anybody out there ever finds themselves in a situation where they have to fall asleep, do you remember what I'm? Do you remember the hot tip? What you said to do? Oh, um, I don't. But I'd like you to remind me quick. It was it was the military training. You you um you basically oh. go yeah. Oh yeah, there's a thing and uh, yeah. Yeah, dude. I, I thought you were talking about some other things, uh, which is, uh, you know, illegal. But what, what um, you can do is you can do what's called a listen and watch patrol. So if you ever have to sleep out um, rough or outside, outdoors, and you're not really too sure of the area, what you do is, uh, it's in, in the military, it's called a listen and watch. And you basically enter an area very quietly and uh you just stay very very still for about five to ten to thirty minutes and you just literally listen and watch it's as simple as that but within the first five minutes you'll have you'll you'll start to uh calm down your heart rate will lower you become very present and you'll start to realize okay what's around me you'll hear the traffic you'll know where the roads are You'll hear dogs barking. And uh, as long as it's not a windy night, you'll hear if anything is moving nearby. And uh, most people and nefarious characters, they can't be quiet. You know, they're not sneaky uh, in general. So if you're uh, about to sleep in a, in a built up area, if you're quiet for five to 30 minutes, uh, the person who would attack you will reveal itself before you go to sleep. And therefore you won't sleep beside anyone crazy. So I yeah. would do that. 30 minutes I would have a look around the area and remain quiet and uh, by the time my 30 minutes were up my heart rate has dropped um, and I've kind of eased my consciousness into the area I know my surroundings and I become one with my area and before you know it I'm ready to snooze yeah uh, that phrase that, that Frank said he said it to me before and I said what and it's called a built up area a meaning like a city area where it's built up I like oh, that yeah. built up yeah, that's just that's some old, uh, you know, speech habits from uh, training. So fighting in built-up areas is fibua. It's called fibua, F-I-B-U-A. And if you're fighting in built-up areas, you're you're you know you're clearing buildings, clearing houses, throwing in flashbangs, and uh, and moving on, advancing forward, advancing. You know what, at, at one point, you were walking. It might have been. I'm gonna say near San Jose. Maybe it was like your third, fourth day, fifth day in, sometime in there. I think could be wrong. And I remember there was a guy cooking on the side of the road with the shopping cart. Remember? Yeah. T tell yeah. us about that. Like, what what happened with that? Like, how'd that oh, come yeah. about? Yeah, so that, that's Andrew. Andrew, I'm still just thinking of him now. I hope he's doing all right. So, Andrew, uh, I'm coming out of... I had... I had uh, John was there that day. He's helping me film. And um, I had just done a small piece in a dental surgery who had offered... One of the things about the walk was you could contact me through social media. And if you wanted me to drop by your place and I was on, it was on the way, I'd figure out a way to work it into the production. Right. So um, that day, that night, I was going to be performing at the San Jose Improv with Craig Shoemaker was kindly going to let me go up on, uh, on stage. And I hadn't slept. It was like day five. I'm very tired. I'm feeling a bit down. And, um, you know, a lot of emotions. you got demons at that point when you're that tired. And it's been raining. It's San Francisco. The weather is not good. It's very damp and it's very cold. And as I'm walking down the road, I, I'm kind of at a really low ebb. It was almost miraculous. I'm uh, not feeling good. And then all of a sudden, a guy 
just kind of checks in and goes, hey, dude, you all right? And I forget that I'm looking disheveled and kind of falling apart. And I'm obviously not in a good emotional state. And it's Andrew. And Andrew is living in a ditch under a piece of plastic between the plastic and a rundown car with his girlfriend. And on the back of his shopping cart, he's Jerry Riggs, a gas stove, and he's cooking hot dogs, <laughs> right? So there's me out there trying to help the homeless. And then all of a sudden, the homeless man is cooking me breakfast. Uh, not only did he kind of fill me up with food, but he gave me that, uh, that real sense of like, oh my gosh, I'm being looked after. There are good humans in the world. And, and yeah. it was, I think that was the turning point for me because I kind of went into the project with a lot of ego. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it fast. I have the training. I'm the tough guy. And at this point, I was broken <laughs> and I was saved by the people that I was, you know, supposed to be helping. So it, it really yeah. made it really <clears throat> grand the whole project and made it. A, a, from that point on, I realized that I needed to be uh, more present and, and, uh, let my ego fade away and my, my desire to control the whole project was not important it was more about what mm. the project revealed to me and yeah. uh, in that well, moment um, it became a lot more focused on the plight of the homeless and uh, a lot less on frank cronin generating content as he walks south to raise money for the homeless yeah <laughs> yeah they uh um you must have been really hungry man i don't know if i would eat a hot dog off of a you know what i mean like but you're like you, you must have felt safe and you're like all right fire kills germs let's do this yeah it's <laughs> you know? funny I, yeah i i don't really think i thought of it at the time you know um i i think uh, a lot of conditioning over time just uh you know i've been camping with my family since i was since before i can remember we'd either camp in my cousin's farm or at you know in a in a public forest or you know in a foreign yeah. in a foreign country yeah. And so uh, food would fall on the floor and uh, I prefer my food on a plate in a clean restaurant. But like, you know, I, <laughs> yeah. if, yeah. If, uh, if someone is kind enough who has nothing to cook me food, I'm, I'm going to take a chance. You know, it's like, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was nice. But you are right. I mean, there's, I, as I walked away, I did think, oh, I might pay for this later. But I didn't. Yeah. Good old Andrew. He cooks well. Nice. They, um. Uh, from my memory, uh, going from San Jose to Santa Cruz, uh, isn't that like a very steep mountain? And what was that like to, to hike over that mountain? Yeah, so I'll meet, yeah, oh God, you know your geography. Yeah, so I just come out of uh, the San Jose Improv, where Craig let me jump up. And it, for anyone, if you're doing stand-up comedy, you kind of get wired after your set. So I thought I'd be exhausted. I was already pretty tired. Uh, I was breaking down that morning. Andrew gave me the hot dog. <laughs> no euphemism and then i went did the, <laughs> did the gig and then uh i i just had lead, you know leader's legs you get really excited and adrenalized from comedy so i was going to be up anyway so i decided to go walk into the hills and um as i kept walking i just found like oh my god i, I can keep going wherever this reserve was coming from mm. so i did like i did 18 20 miles that night i think and uh and i ended up kind of sleeping at the top above a reservoir and be behind a guardrail. And uh, I woke up that morning to somebody looking over the guardrail asking me, was I all right? So that was mm. pretty surreal, dude. Pretty intense. For, for that walk, did you walk along the freeway, like on the bike lane or something? Or, or... Oh, no, that got pretty wild. So I, I walked from the comedy club, walked to the suburbs. I remember sneaking in around the back of a post office, hopping a fence, because mm. uh, I'm using my phone now to sat I have uh, two apps open on my phone and a battery pack leading into the phone and uh, I hop into the back of a post office and then I hop over a fence and then I'm I can see that if I make my way around the side of a reservoir like about a mile and a half up uh, and if, if I don't get caught I knew that would probably be not something I'm supposed to be doing but if I don't get caught that'll cut like five miles and I won't have to walk across a big, busy freeway in the middle of the night. So yeah. I, I decided to go the mountain way. And uh, lo and behold, the only, the only thing I saw up there that night was uh, a few deer 
and like thousands of frogs. I remember that there was just thousands of frogs singing to me. Uh, <laughs> that was pretty cool. Um, that might have been yeah, the so acid that that might have been the acid that was on the hot dog from Andrew. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but there's yeah, very possible. I'll tell you, uh, there was probably a few drugs around, all right, but not not in my particular meal. Uh, but there is some some very interesting brain chemistry does happen when you're out there. The lower on fumes you get, yeah. and uh, the the more silence and more alone time, uh, you start to realize that we live in a very very uh, a, a a, there's a hidden world within our brains that we're distracted from most of the time by high fructose food, noise, social media, and the city. When you mm. get out into nature and you're really pushing the limits of your your uh, endurance or anything like that, you start to come in contact with all sorts of phenomena in your brain that you didn't even know existed, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Did did you have any weapons in case there was like a, a dog, like a, like a, like, let's say you're out there and some dog comes at you or did you even. I, no. I, uh, I, I made it, I had a thought. I, at, there were at times I did pick up a, I picked up a metal something on the railroad tracks. Cause I thought I was about to be attacked. But at one point I'll get into that. But in general, I didn't, I, I didn't want to carry anything. Did I didn't carry a knife. I made a point of that. I figured if someone had a knife, I could, you know, I can run first or I can, I can just take their one and then finish them off that way. So yeah. I didn't want to be carrying anything. I knew I'd be stopped by the cops, which I was a few times. And the last thing yeah. I wanted was to uh, forfeit the whole walk. Cause that was the thing. If, if I, if I, if I, if I was picked up by the cops, that would have been the whole thing done, you know? Uh, I know, I know when I go, yeah, oh, 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 hold that thought. When I go on my, my little walks out there in the country, I always carry like this ax handle and uh <laughs> yeah. and i just kind of just just you know it's like a walking stick but i think just in case a coyote or something comes at me i got some something you know yeah no you're dead right man i mean that would be the that would be the sensible thing to do um there was a one it does something innate about it. there's something instinctual about it you feel better carrying a stick walking down the road and kind of as you get older, you forget how good it feels to carry a stick walking <laughs> yeah but when you're a kid you remember walking down the road with a <laughs> stick Oh my god, the excitement! Know, and that, and you're not doing anything; you just have a stick. <laughs> but uh, yeah, dude. So I'm walking on the railroad tracks. I'm having my little experience with God, you know, or whatever I think I'm experiencing up there. Who knows? And uh, all of a sudden, I the one of the rocks, or at least something, moved the heavy rocks between the sleepers, between the wooden slats on the railroad tracks in front of me, about twenty feet. And uh, it was definitely big. It could have been a deer or it could have been a mountain lion, but I was, you know, for a long period of time, a long number of hours, I was hyper adrenalized, sure that I was going to be attacked by something. And that something would probably try and eat me because I'm, you're not in a great frame of mind. Like this is day yeah. 10 or 15. And, you know, you, you start to, there's a part of your psyche that opens up when you're outside uh, that, that, I think everyone has, and you you only tap into it when you're under pressure, and it's a kind of survival stroke. You know, whatever comes at me, I will kill it. Mm. And uh, that was that was definitely you know pumping through my brain for about ten, five, ten hours. Do you, Do you remember that? Uh, um, you're out there walking. I, th I think it was in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and up ahead, you actually spotted another person with a shovel. Um, oh man yeah that? yeah a lot of weird experiences yeah i met a guy out in the middle of nowhere just after crossing a railroad track i think it was coming into actually more more close to santa maybe santa barbara a bit before but there was a guy just like digging a hole like <laughs> i don't know what he was doing but you know he didn't look well and uh he just kind of nodded i have about three seconds of it on my camera roll but the guy was ghoulish you know like i didn't know whether he was bearing bearing his uh his number twos or he was burying a body that's the truth and uh I, I i just kept moving man you mean i mean there's people out there that you don't know they're kind of there's a reason that there's people out there right some of them are struggling some of them are suffering some of them are uh you know there's people out there for a million different reasons and the goal is to help the ones you can help but there's definitely predators out there, you know, people that are kind of uh, 
you see it in their eyes. There's a, it's not just it's not just drugs and it's not just average, you know, mental illness. You know, uh, it's not the homeless people that that you think of when you're thinking of helping people. There's just every now and then you'll cross paths. You know, I was meeting a lot of people most nights, especially in the middle of the night. There's a lot of people up and about. A lot of people do meth mm. so that they're not bothered by the police. Mm. Uh, they're also doing meth because they're enjoying the meth. But th there's there's a, a lot of people like to stay up in the middle of the night um, to avoid confrontations like with the police. And then they sleep during the day. It's more calm. It's less. They're less prone to attack. Did you and, get in? Uh, did you ever get into any any uh, situations where you're like, okay, this is getting a little uncomfortable. This person's like, sort of invading was, you know, my. Space. Yes. Yeah. Walk. Sorry. Yeah. Walking through San Francisco the first night that was like shocking. Like, walking through the tenderloin, just thousands and thousands of people. You realize oh, the scope of the problem, you know, and there's there's uh, uh, just a lot of suffering. A lot of people out there that just you know society has forgotten, and uh, they're really living in hell, man. You know, it's pretty. It's pretty sad. It's it's brutal, and then. You know, then in the more rural areas, you'll actually meet people who are kind of like, it's kind of in tune with the energy of the location they are. So they're more calm, you know, mm. uh, or maybe their temperament brought them out of the city, out to the more <laughs> rural areas to live in the, the bush there. You know, it's like, if I know, I do know that if I was to choose where, if I was living out long term, I always tried to go somewhere quiet away from other people. Like it's a survive. There's, there, there's nothing more terrifying than falling asleep in public. Like it's, it's uh, not only is it kind of embarrassing initially until you kind of ground yourself in the, until it becomes the norm, but it's, it's a, uh, there's a fearful aspect to it that kind of pervades your whole senses. Like you're, you're hyper aware. Yeah. You're aware that there's psych goes out there. So uh, yeah, I don't know. What? It's a, uh, tell us stuff. about tell us about police did you get stopped by the cops at all or the police yeah a few different times i managed to capture it on camera i i kind of looked forward to it because i knew i could whip out the phone real quick and get a cool interaction uh, it's not <laughs> <up>. <laughs> yeah but, but i was also you know a little apprehensive that they would have a problem uh, but i would yeah. always just hold my hands up and uh immediately de-escalate try and do what i would want uh if if i was to meet someone in the middle of the night so i'd be wearing a you know a balaclava or a ski mask to keep me warm so i'm you know i'm looking like a psycho walking down the side of the road with a ski mask on so the last thing i want to do is spook these lads so um when they pull me over i would uh We'd have a little chat. It would be tense for the first few seconds. You know, what What are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. 50 questions. And then as soon as I, I try and pull the whole, the whole showbiz thing, like, oh, no, I'm doing this. I got people following me, tracking me via satellite, because you could you could do that on the on the phone. Um, and then they would, by the end of it, they would want to photograph because they didn't know uh, that I was nobody, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and uh, then they would some cops actually helped me they gave me a shortcut they told me they gave me they like they basically let me break the rules for the charity they said you can tonight walk along the hard shoulder of this thing we won't stop you we'll call ahead the cops at the next in the next town are expecting you and they'll be keeping an eye out for you it's like okay amazing wow you know? that's yeah cool. that was pretty gnarly you know once they know you're doing a good thing um I remember at one point you were walking and, and you were, um, it was, I think it was near Santa Cruz. And I guess you got shin splints from the hard pavement of walking all those miles. And, and do you remember that when you just had to like cool your, your legs in the ocean water and just camp there for two or three days? Yeah. Yeah, man. So I started off way too fast. I, uh, I thought I was, there's a thing. It's kind of like invincibility mode. You think you're really tough and then all of a sudden your body just, lets you know that you're going going too hard so i thought i'm really fit it's going great uh the more miles i cover the quicker i get home uh but instead i i overdid it and uh i thought i had shin splints but turned out that uh, a friend of mine brought me one of those rollers for the front of my legs he, he was driving mm -hmm. down from san francisco and he was following along and he said he just said damn it i'll throw the, the roller in the back and if i can find frank via the tracking I'll drop off the roller. So I'm walking along one day. I'm at a garage. 
and uh, he pulls up, he gives me the roller and I was able to roll out these knots in the front of my legs. I had never, I didn't even know it was possible to have knots in the front of mm. your leg. <laughs> so these little bumps, I was able to kind of flatten them out over the course of about three days by rolling out the muscle and every day dipping my, just kind of paddling in the, uh, paddling in the sea. It was actually from Christmas day till about four days after Christmas. So I spent four days around Christmas um, healing my legs. And it, that was another kind of transition point. Andrew was the first thing that grounded me. And then the second thing was, it was almost like, okay, Frank, slow down. It's not about the speed. It's not about the, the performance, physical performance aspect. Let the universe come to you at the speed and uh, try not to control so much. And from yeah. then on, that thing went really great. As soon as I stopped trying to control the outcomes of every day and just get into the, the flow of things. That was I, I remember, oh, by the way, we didn't mention until right now, um, Frank, Tr Tr he, did, he, he did this in December up until February, I think. Like the coldest, oh. rainiest, foggiest, the worst time to do this. This wasn't like you know, 72 degrees and sunny. I mean, the night that you started, I was in Sacramento, which is about two hours from where you were at. And it mm -hmm. was just raining cats and dogs. It was, the rain came down so hard. I remember I, I was in a movie theater and I came out of the movie theater and it was just pouring rain. And I'm like, wow, tonight's the night that Frank started. This, that was crazy to me. Like, Yeah, the thing is California, no matter what time of the year, to an Irishman genuinely feels like paradise. So, so you're, it, you know, growing up in a, in a cold, uh, wet climate and then with the, the military background, it's, it, 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 it's kind of a pleasure any time of the year in California, genuinely. Like not, it's just, it just it, Psychologically, it's not as damaging. But I knew that that would look really uh, wild to a lot of people who live in California. Like, because most people I've noticed in California, they don't like wind and they don't like rain. But uh, so yeah. that kind of helped raise money. But... Uh, so from a psychological standpoint, uh, mentally, I kind of like it. <clears throat> um, yeah, you're right, because yeah, yeah, to do that in like July or August, I mean, forget about it with our fair skin, especially like me, man. Look at this. This would be like, you know. Oh, yeah. well, to be honest, it was beneficial. I did. I did weigh that up. I thought, OK, so there'd be no mosquitoes. The mosquitoes love me, dude. I don't know what it is. And uh, so no mosquitoes, not too much sun. And uh, it's Christmas time. So people will be at home with extra hours to consume content and will raise more money. So that was definitely factored in. And in, in the, I, I, I had weighed that up uh, mm -hmm. when I was planning it. But also, it, you know, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of it was just, hey, grab the phone, grab the battery pack and, uh, and go. Because uh, the, whole, the whole point is of Rough Set is to perform comedy, raise money for charity and kind of figure out all the problems along the way and document overcoming the problems. Cause no one really wants to see a succeed dude. As soon as I got that stick in the eye, the money started coming in. So mm -hmm. people wanted me to suffer. So I, I was happy when it rains. Um, I went through the biggest rainstorm of the year. Or I think it was like in two years. I ended yeah. up kind of, yeah, it was in, I was going through wine country. I just come down off some mountains and I'm walking through a valley and all of a sudden just like a like a biblical tempest, man, just kicks up. So that was that was the first night I pulled out the plastic sheet and I jumped in under some eucalyptus tree <laughs> just, you know, online and I'm kind of just weathering it. You can hear the thunder going in the background. Uh, I'm not sure if that's on the video, but thunder, lightning. And I'm just under mm. these eucalyptus trees, but I'm so tired and I'm so cozy underneath this plastic that I, I slept like for eight to, to 12 hours, woke up, wow. pristine, pristine air, completely renewed. And then I uh, met some beautiful people that day along the way. Who... By the way, guys, he, I believe are, are you, you're making a documentary of, of this walk, right? Like everything you're talking about, we'll be able to see it somewhere, sometime, hopefully. Yeah, somewhere, sometime. So yeah, the, the, I think in about a month and a half, but I've been saying that for quite a while. Um, the problem has been basically there was almost a TV show called Rough Set. Uh, there still may be, I'm hopeful for the future, but uh, things got caught in production, then COVID hit. And, uh, and so just, just 
for many reasons, some of them production reasons and some of them uh, legal and some of them just because of uh, COVID, it's been delayed. But I do intend on, on, on uh, cutting together a nice piece that documents the trip and uh, hopefully raise a little more for homeless health. I'm, la I'm laughing because I know how Hollywood is. Like they'll, they're like, we love that story, but we're going to recast it and we're going to have The Rock playing you. <laughs> and it'll be like The Rock oh, doing the walk. Yeah. Or yeah, no, they're looking for someone with teeth that are together, you know. That's a, yeah, Hollywood's wild. You can, there's only so much you can um, try and live up to Hollywood. It's almost, what I'm learning is the less you try and live up to Hollywood's expectations, the more they look over and they go, what's he doing over there? So I'm, yeah. I'm just going, hey, man, I, I know at some point I've seen it enough in life. You just keep doing you and the more authentic and close to yourself you can be, all of a sudden people, there's something magical about mm -hmm. being yourself. So I'll just wait till Hollywood looks over here. I, I'm not gonna chase them. You know, I noticed with with weight loss, like people get re they really get excited for somebody. Let's say somebody weighs 400 pounds. Like the <laughs> first when they drop the first 20 pounds, everyone's like, "Yeah, you could do it." But then they yeah. get kind of bored during the middle of the journey. But they like the end. So they like they like when someone starts the journey of weight loss, and they like the end. Like you look great. You're down to you know. Was it like that with your walk where they were excited for you the first week and then they kind of lost interest or did it just build and build or like, what was that like? Well, yeah, I, I imagine that was the case. Um, it was pretty surreal, man, because people were finding it all the time and I would do more and more media as I went south. Mm. Sorry, as I went south. Yeah. So from, from my perspective, <clears throat> And probably because I'm tricking myself, like it really, I, I needed the motivation. I wasn't having a great time out there. Like it wasn't that pleasant, you know? Yeah. So I convinced myself that everyone was watching. Uh, and then I get, you know, but realistically, yeah, I would say most people probably half looked at a video, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and then maybe another video <laughs> three days later. But in my head, everyone's following along watching. Um, yeah. But, you know, uh, at, at some point it did towards the end it really built man i mean at some point chris o'dowd you know reached retweeted the story and then i'm in the daily mail in england while i'm walking and living under a piece of plastic wow. and then inside edition and then i'm on tv it's like and then jeff garland's gonna close the show and preacher lawson from america's got talent like at all these cool things these cool people and i'm name dropping them because i they're they're great people dude they are they're literally they are. just yeah they're there's a reason they're successful. They're very good people. And um, Moses Storm too. And um, yeah, just what, what's the just, in my what head, is, it was all the time. But in reality, there was a lot of people not caring, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because even with, you know, like my podcast or my YouTubes, every now and then I'll be like, like, ah, people aren't, you know, they're not liking it or as much as they used to, or, you know, hitting that like button or commenting or sharing, whatever. I get in my head where, and then, you know, two weeks later, it goes up again. And I'm like, okay, good. But it's just that insecure part of us, you know, we want everything to go like bigger, 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 bigger. Um, what is the most amount of miles you think you walked? And do you know which, which part of that walk it was? Yeah, towards the end, I wanted to... Yeah, dude. I think first of all, I think you're right, man. We're always we're always chasing. We always level up psychologically, and we always acclimatize, and we always want more. But I think the real secret, and I think we we know this, but we don't always live up to it, is is that if you live in the present, there's no problems, and if you take away expectations, there's happiness. So that's the way I try and operate. I try and be happy with nothing, but yeah, I always want more, more. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so speaking of more. At the start, I thought 20 miles was a lot, but uh, the human body is amazing, man. Like, you know, I learned a lot about, a lot about the human body. So at the start, 20 miles, 24 miles felt like a lot. In the, I think it was the third to last day, uh, I banged out 41 miles pretty easy, like all in one sitting. I did about, when I say all in one sitting, within a 24 hour period. So I, I would do 10 to 12 hours just plodding along, you know, and uh, documenting and uploading and tweeting and interviews. And then I take a two hour break and uh, and then I do, I just go, go hell for leather. I want to see what I could get done in 24 hours. What could Frank Cronin's body do in 24 hours? And it turned out at that time it was 41 or 42 miles. 
So that mm. that was like, an, I did that in the, you would think at the end of it, you know, you're going to be really tired, but actually you I, I think your body is an incredible vessel that we don't really tap. We don't really test it, man. Like I, I mean, there are people doing 150 miles of pop now. So I bet you. They're probably running you, though. They're running though. Right. Aren't they running or biking yeah. or, or yeah. driving? <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I do know now that I could, you know, 40, I know now because I reached it. Uh, I thought a marathon was a lot. Now 40, I think is, is, oh, that's probably just the middle. I bet you, I bet you I could do 80. I bet you with it. You know, I think we can do a lot of things that we don't even, we don't even consider, man. Like, cause we're all told that we're, you know, we're dumbed down. We're fed crap food. We're told it's better mm. to sit and watch TV. So, but uh, yeah, bodies are crap, man. Two things I want to I want to ask you before we end. Uh, first one, and I always ask this at the end of the show if I remember. Um, Frank, do you have any words of wisdom? Anything you'd like to share? Any life advice? Something you've learned along along the way? Um, yes, and I think I got this from the walk, which is basically we're distracted from this beautiful calmness. Um, and it's hidden behind a wall of distractions. It's hidden behind social media, chasing the next paycheck, getting a bigger car, trying to meet up with friends. It's just, there's a stillness. And if we can tap into that stillness, there is something there that I think some people call God, source energy, uh, universal energy. But there's a reason those monks are up the hill for millennia and we're not smarter than them. There's a whole world inside us that stillness, time alone, and silence opens up. And uh, ever since that walk, my life has changed in a, in a, in a manner that it's very hard to explain. But to get there, all I need to do is be silent and stop worrying about the future, stop thinking about the past and just breathe and think about the present. And all of a sudden, this beautiful, reassuring energy, expansive energy uh, pervades my sense of perception. And I know it's available for everybody and it's hidden from us by all this this crap <laughs> you know what i mean the chase what's in the future what's in the future the present the present is bigger than any achievement we're ever going to have on this planet and i i would love people to have that sense uh, of understanding that is growing inside me it's like a knowing now you know it's a it's a very humbling knowing yes and the monks know about it and the priests know about it. And the, the Buddha knew about it. And <laughs> nowadays, for some reason, we don't talk about it. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, oh, let me think. Uh, oh, this is great. This is kind of related to this. Uh, you've been on my podcast before and one time I asked you this question, I think somebody had just told you this that day and it was so fresh in your mind and you may have, may or may not have remembered this, but I thought this was great. Do you remember what your buddy, or maybe it was you, that they would do every time they would, they basically readjusted their thinking when they, when they had, when they were in traffic and they came to a red light. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah. It's a good life hack. Well, li you know, life is pretty stressful. And sometimes again, because we're caught in expectations and the, the gap between your expectations and reality. I mean, that's literally where depression seems to live. So one, one way to just pull yourself into the present, a nice little life hack is that at every traffic light, if you come across a traffic light, usually that's a negative. But as you approach the traffic light, just think of it as an opportunity when it's red to take a breath and come back into the present and appreciate and be grateful for your existence. Sounds very, very kind of woo-woo, very like, what the? Oh, he's been in Hollywood too long. But the reality is gratitude, man. Gratitude keeps you grounded in the present. 
lowers your expectations about an untenable future. And all of a sudden, because you're grateful, life is good. And there's no when you're grateful. You can't be grateful and happy and worried at the same time. You can only do one. The more you do it, there's plenty of traffic lights in LA. I'll tell you that. So I've become very grateful to it. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Because after you said that, I, I, I was like, you know what? That's a great thing to do. I'm, I'm pretty gra- gracious. You know, I have a lot of, gra- is the word gracious? I, I have a lot of gra- attitude of gratitude generally. But I'm like, you know what? Every time I get to a red light, you know, rather than being like, ah, I'm just like, no, just, Think of something I'm happy for. And it, it really, it just, it becomes sort of your personality after a while. But I thought that was great. It's a great tip. Don't yeah. be like, I, I, eh, red light. Just be like, no, it's, it's, a, it's a moment to stop and be thankful that I'm, and really I've timed some of those red lights. They're not that long. It seems like a long time, but if you physically look at it, you're like, dang, this one was only 30 seconds or this one was only a minute. It's not that long, you know? Yeah, well, we, you know, yeah, once, once, once we realize we create all the tension in our life and that it's all optional, you know, there's, um, you can live on water and uh, a little bit of rice and uh, under a little bit of plastic and be very, very happy. Yeah. Once, 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 you know, really struggling at least once a year, you know, being, being wet, tired, uh, scared, alone, uh, just having... Just getting that reboot, that back to factory settings, that survival instinct once a year minimum, yeah. that that will, uh, you will appreciate nearly everything. Because when I got home, dude, just lying in bed felt like I was on planet luxury. It felt like in, I was- In closing, in closing let's close on that. Because <clears throat> I would love to know what that's like. So you've done this walk 40 days, 41 days, the rain, the cold nights, the cops, the animals, yep. Andrew's hot dogs people you know maybe giving you a crazy look you don't know what's going to happen the broken glass the comedy sets the the alone time in a weird way it must have felt like wow this is all coming to an end part of you might have been happy and then part of you is like wow back to my normal life again this is that's going to be a a shock was it a shock to go from that to normal life normal life yeah the biggest shock was just lying down and realizing that i had four walls around me and then then trying to come to terms with the fact that the people that I met along the way are still out there and nobody cares. That, that's a, that was a big mental, that made me very sad. And to this day, if I think about it, uh, if I give, if I open the aperture on that thought, uh, it gets pretty dark, pretty quick. Uh, you know, they're still out there. They're just as nice as they were and they're probably mm-hmm. degrading. So that's not good. You know, was that, and, was that, just, that, I'm sorry, but that must've just even, I would imagine just being able to go into a, to a, an apartment or a house or whatever, wherever you live and be able to shut that door and turn a lock to be like, Oh, oh and then a shower and a bed. I mean, you must've just slept. Like, yeah. Because, yeah, because uh, li- living out and living rough brings you down to kind of like a base reality where everything good that happens to you feels like a 10 X moment, a 10 X, like somebody mm. handing you a hot dog off the back of a shopping cart when you're having a bad day and they're, you know, you know, you know, they're not washing their hands every, every second. When, when that becomes a luxury, all of a sudden the world is like, you know, it's a playground of joy. So, uh, you know, that, it's just regrounding yourself once a year. That, that really helped me, man. And um, I will say, though, I had been moving at such a pace that when I got back, there was a, there was kind of a chemical imbalance. Uh, you know, I had been moving with adrenaline, endorphins, quite a lot of publicity. And then all of a sudden, it's just silence, no movement. Hmm. And so I tried to hit the gym pretty hard when I got back to keep away the melancholy, which was uh, starting to come in, you know, like, I never experienced melancholy or depression, but uh, I'll tell you, after 40 days of high exertion, uh, publicity and all those chemicals that come with, you know, doing 20, 30 miles a day or 10 miles to 30 miles a day, 40 miles a day is, um, it does a recalibration that has to take place. That took about six months to come down off that walk, honestly, if I'm, if I'm completely honest. And, uh, that was humbling, you know? That's like when you realize you think you're the tough man, you just did this big walk. 
and you're like as high as you'll ever be and then obviously you got to pay the price at some point dude they never like the universe doesn't let you win without losing i'll tell you that that's for sure Uh, yeah hey uh, i got one for you would you ever maybe you could walk from like los angeles to las vegas or something Yes, I've mapped it out, actually. I mapped that one out there about six months ago. I thought about it, uh, weighed it up. Um, and then I actually wrote, that was actually, we based the first the first season of the TV show around that. Mm. And uh, it got picked up by a production company. But uh, then COVID hit literally mm. a month after we signed the, the contract. So we'll revisit it. Uh, but yeah, I'm looking across in America, actually. I'm, I'm wow. thinking about it. Yeah, just and I'll do it. Just I'll do it alone, uh, and I will uh, go with the flow. I've learned so much from the first two walks: the the San Francisco, LA, and the Galway to Dublin, Ireland. That I think the real experience is uh, honoring the individual weird journey of somebody who goes with the flow. That's that's the show is, is th- those beautiful interactions and connections that you have when you're alone out there and you need help, you know? Yeah. That's, that's the show, bro, you know? <laughs> and not, Hollywood doesn't always get it. It's not big enough for Hollywood, but I know that that is a... <laughs> that, that I, know. Is a I know it's a valuable show, and I know that if I see... <laughs> yeah. If I saw... Uh, yeah. I, 16, dude... I mean that the show that I have in my head will change a lot of young men's perspective on life. What the- I, I'm I'm picturing Hollywood. They're going to make it. They're going to change it. They're going to be like, all right, Frank, you're in charge of these ten people, and they're all ages, you know, twenty one to twenty nine, and and there's going to be, yeah. you know, what I mean, you're the leader of the group or something like that. You're like, yeah. <laughs> like, no, that ain't my show, man. That's a great show, but it ain't my show. I ain't doing that show. Yeah, I mean, you got yeah. There's a, you know, paychecks come with the uh, with whatever, right? So. Uh, the great thing is, uh, it, because it's like a, a cool project, the people who were interested were super cool. Team was super good. They'd like 150 Emmys under their belts. Uh, so I'm hopeful that, that we'll reopen that, that project. And if we don't, um, luckily my mindset uh, is it's truthfully, I, I'd love a paycheck, but to be honest, man, if I'm out there walking with a credit card and I have 30 bucks a day, you know, just for like luxuries, like food and all that stuff. I would love to just walk across the state sleeping in a ditch, man. I would love that. I mean, going to yeah. be dead soon. You may as well do the crazy stuff. We're all by the broke. way, guys. But by, by the way, if uh, we're going to wrap this up, but if anybody's watching this or listening to this, uh, message us or leave it, leave leave it on YouTube on the comments. Leave in the comment in the YouTube. Let us know where you're at, and uh, Frank maybe can map out his his uh, journey and maybe pay you a visit or something. He could sleep in his, uh, you could, he'll sleep in your barn or something. Yeah. Yeah. Ne- yeah. <laughs> next year. Uh, we, we, or this year, later this year, we'll weigh it up. And uh, I have a few little films. I'm shooting something in Georgia next week. And cool. then my visa is being renewed actually uh, this week too. So as long as that all goes to, to plan and uh, we we'll bang out those little films. Uh, then I think my schedule is open and I, I might just, uh, it's the beautiful thing is, dude, it's literally like, hey, Darren, this is how casual it can be. Hey, Darren, I'm going. Have I got my wallet? Yeah. Have I got my phone? Yeah. I'm good, dude. I can just head to New York right now from LA. I can literally just get out of the car. Wow. Like, that's how free. It's so magical, bro. By the way, here's what I want to do. I want to end the show and I want to end the show with you opening the door and just walking away. That would be awesome. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> just walking out. so frank thank you so much uh we'll look for you online we're, we're, tell us a place where we can find you at franciscronin.com and when i'm walking you can satellite track me through franciscronin.com it, it uh it's rigged to my phone so you can follow along and meet me along the way and walk with me clear your head uh come out and have those great interactions and we'll raise a little money for charity this is what the first this it'll pretty much look like this when i start my next walk um, I'd like to go for a walk. Where are you going? New York. Okay. Bye. <laughs> it's this easy, dude. And I'm off. <laughs> I'm off, dude. I'm off to New York. It's that easy. It's crazy, right? <laughs> and no, awesome. Yeah. There's nothing. No worries. No overheads. Just complete freedom, bro. 
That's great. Credit See card in the pocket. See you, bro. Bye. Bye. We're done with this interview. Pocket party.